and they represent kind of the spirituality. Okay. Um, it, it's sort of like what in Christianity would be, you know, the Trinity, where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And of course, the Son is Jesus, who was a historical person, and of course, he's considered the Son of God, and so forth. So there's some differences, but it could be seen in the same kind of way. Um, and in fact, it's called Trikaya in Buddhism. Tri is three and Kaya is body. So three bodies are three manifestations of, of Buddhahood. And they have technical names like um, Dharmakaya is the, is the, would be equivalent to the, to the Father or God. Formless, timeless, spaceless okay, um, of, of Buddhahood or sometimes in Sanskrit called sunyata, or emptiness, the great emptiness, or the, or the absolute emptiness, is the, is the most fundamental truth there is. Okay. And from that comes um, the equip of Gautama Buddha, historical person. Okay. And, um, and the spirituality that of the Holy Spirit or Christhood, if you will. You see, uh, when Jesus becomes Christ, uh, he became something more than just an individual, you know, historical person. And the same thing with Gautama Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, when he became enlightened. Okay. But, it, but it, there's a lot of differences between those two parallel, Trinity and the Trakaya, but, but it's kind of interesting that they do have this sort of gross similarity. Um, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit would, would uh, correspond in the Buddhist Trakaya to um, uh, this category of Buddhism I'm talking about, where it talks about Sambhogaya, or the spiritual enjoyment body of the Buddha. Enjoyment means that people can, it's, it, uh, well, it's sometimes put like this, Dharmakaya, there's no beginning and no end. Okay, it's beyond time. The Manakaya, or the, or the fo form, Siddhartha Gautama, historical person, has a beginning and end. He was born and died. Okay. Samboragaya, the spiritual body, the third body, had a beginning, but it has no end. Okay. So no end, no beginning. Beginning and an end. Beginning, but no end. Kind of, kind of a new kind of thing, but but it began when with with the Buddha's experience as as, as the Buddha, okay? and that spirituality put into the world okay? is going to keep going, okay? just like holy, the action, Holy Spirit in action, and um, so different expressions have been made of that, and if it's expressed art, um, in a statue, you know, there's all kind of statues of different Buddhas. They're not the historical Buddhas, they're idealistic Buddhas. So in Shin Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism, it's Amida Buddha, which means the Buddha of infinite light and life. Light corresponds to wisdom and light corresponds to compassion. Um, so wisdom and compassion, two major spiritual qualities that are embodied by this standing Buddha that we call Amida Buddha you would see enshrined if you went to a Pure Land temple. Um, and there are also other kinds of uh, Buddhas, or sometimes called Bodhisattvas, um, Buddhas to be, you know, like Kuan Yin or, or, or Kanon, different names in different cultures, but uh, sometimes called Goddess of Mercy, or you know, really concentrating on representing compassion. Okay. Sometimes you see them with a lot of lot of arms, more arms to help help people. Um, or there might be uh, bodhisattvas that, that are you know, Manjushri, or wisdom. Or you might have Maitreya, the future Buddha. You know? So they're all serving a particular purpose. Okay? They're not real Buddhas in the sense of being, having existed you know, historically or so forth. But they represent these qualities and they're represented pictorially, visually, and architecturally or whatever. Um, so in our ch church, uh, our tradition of Shin Buddhism, 
um, that was the ordination that he took when he, my father went to study in Japan. Because he was a Nisei, I'm Sansei, he's Nisei, he's second generation, which would be born, a lot of them were um, born, in, all of them were born in America, some of them went back to Japan to study, okay, and then came back to America. My father was one of those. And, um, but he, when, when he studied under his teacher and got ordained, it was in this uh, Pure Land uh, tradition. But the reason I mention this is because our temple is kind of unique. My father's temple is kind of unique in that his teacher said, well, you're going to go back to America. You know, your whole vision in life was American Buddhism. You should, you should start an independent church. Um, and so he did. Um, almost every church or temple in any, every religion, they have some kind of hierarchy or they're part of a, of a system. Or even congregationalists, even if they're you know completely independent, run by boards and everything, but they're still part of whatever uh, denomination they are, and they and they have a headquarters and so forth. I'm not saying this is good or bad or anything, or pros and cons about it. But um, so Buddhist Churches of America maybe represent about 50, one of the larger uh, ethnic Buddhist organizations. Um, I've made about 50 temples across a lot of them on the west coast, of course. Um, and we're from that denomination, and so we enjoy a lot of fellowship with them, and a lot of, um, you know, uh, all the different, the same kind of uh, conferences that they hold and so forth. And um, because all our rituals and teachings are the same. But politically, administratively, our temple was independent. That was a we never broke away. We were founded on that principle, and um, uh, so it, uh, we don't have that kind of a, a tie or, or constraints because that's it. Uh, my father's teacher said that way you'll be free to express and develop the teachings for American Buddhism. So that's kind of the tradition of how I was raised as a very um, liberal, on the very liberal end of the Buddhist continuum. Um, and even after spending three years in Japan to go to study, and I said, well, while you're there, well, you might as well get ordained. Kind of sneaky, but okay, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Um, and, uh, but then I had no, no idea of occupation wise, so when I came back, I went right back into academia. While I was there, I studied um, Shin Buddhism at a particular university, not as part of a degree or anything, but, and then I studied under Zen meditation under both Soto and Rinzai masters there, um, and using a koan system also, and of course in, in Pure Land Buddhism, Nem Butsu, um, meaning, uh, literal meaning is thinking of the Buddha, Butsu means uh, Buddha, Nen means to think of, but uh, one of the primary things is recitation of the name. So Amida Buddha's name, by re reciting the name. Okay. Um, so many times they would say, Namu Amida Butsu. Namu means the, you know, I take refuge, I become one with or, um, the human side, and Amida Buddha's that side. So together, okay. I take refuge in Amida Buddha or the Buddha that emphasizes the spiritual qualities of wisdom and compassion. Other denominational sects, like you might be familiar with Nichiren, um, all of these arose in about the 12th century in Japan, in that northern Mahayana. And uh, these great religious leaders founded these things. Shinran founded Shin Buddhism, Nichiren founded Nichiren, what became Nichiren Buddhism. Nichiren has splintered off into a lot of different groups, Sokogakkai, SGI in America, very prevalent. Um, and their recitation is based upon not an Amida Buddha, but upon the Lotus Sutra. So their Namyo Orenge Kyo means now, same, same now. Say, I take refuge in the Lotus Sutra. Okay. Um, and uh, so they. People like um, uh, uh, Turner, 
was the first one. Tina Turner. Tina Turner. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. all, these, all these people gave good publicity to Buddhism because they became, their, their gate was through Nami uh, Horenge uh, Kyo type of denomination. And then, of course, when, when Tibetan Buddhism is considered a third school of Mahayana and Theravada, but it's more closer to the, to the Mahayana, but it was centered in Tibet. So, Vaj Nirvana, they call it, or Tibetan Buddhism. So, three sort of major schools that are, are represented all over the world and in America and in Chicago. And all of them have their different sub denominations. So, like Tibetan Buddhism, I don't know how many big denominations they might have, you know, quite a few. Okay. Um, and, and, of course, through the Dalai Lama, uh, again, great PR for Buddhism. And you know, he's going to be coming to the Midwest. And he's going to be in, uh, here in, uh, in a week, I think, May 6th, you know, if you're lucky enough to get <coughs> tickets uh, at Fritch near uh, uh, the pavilion in Grand Park. Um, the last time he came was in 1993. Uh, which was the centennial of the World Parliament of Religion, because in 1893, with the World's Fair, here in Chicago, uh, they had uh, all the world religions were represented, and this was sort of the first formal introduction of Buddhism to the West. Of course, Buddhism had come with the immigrants earlier than, earlier than that, but this was the first formal one, and uh, so Chicago was a special place. And so they organized the Centennial in 1993, and uh, it was a tremendous event. They all came, representatives came from all over the world. Thich Nhat Khan came, Dalai Lama came. He also spoke at that time in Grand Park, and uh, people who went, it was a very special atmosphere. Okay. Um, and uh, upon being invited here to your group, um, I thought I invited Richard because uh, he's been leading the, the meditation, sitting meditation groups in the area, he's been a, been a leader there, and uh, as he said, he, he, you know, he's been uh, active in the, you know, for the last 40 years, and um, uh, the calling that he had, or like he would say, Joseph Campbell says, uh, you know, if you're lucky to find a bliss, you know, you follow your bliss. You know, meditation was his bliss. And um, he made his dream come true of, of um, uh, establishing a meditation center in Plymouth, Wisconsin, about two hours north drive. Um, and uh, my father's uh, Buddhist name was uh, Gyome, okay, given by his teacher. Gyome means bright dawn, translated. And so it's called bright dawn. Home spread. Okay. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so I thought he would be a good resource for for your group. And I also invited uh, Asayo Horibe, who um, is another. Both of them, by the way, are are. Um, well, I'm trying. I might be talking about scattered, sounding very scattered, but um, the last ten years or so. I'm not on the minister. I was on the ministerial staff at the Buddhist Temple of Chicago, the temple that my father started in 1944. So they're in their 60-something year, one of the first, the first one in the Chicago area. The Japanese Americans, you know, after the Second World War, they came out of the, the camps, and so that's some, some. There was a, quite a large population in Chicago, so my father came to serve that population and started the, the temple in 1944. Um, and uh, uh, so part of that history, I guess, is that um, uh, when, then when, when I, after I came back um, from Japan, I went back into academia. I was teaching at the uh, University of Wisconsin, which is only two hours away from Chicago. So I sort of got sucked in, <laughs> you know, to help me out at the church. It's only a two-hour drive. I'd come in the weekends or something and, and help out with the Buddhist educational program, the Sunday school and so forth. 
uh, and I was deep up there for about five years, and then a political situation, one of the ministers, we had three ministers there at the church, um, and uh, one of them went to Los Angeles, and there was sort of a need there. And at this time I said, oh, I, I, so I, I made a, I resigned and, and became a full-time minister there at my father's church for about 12 years, from 83 to 95. And, um, uh, and that, was, that was fine. But the last 10 years, uh, after resigning from, from, the, from the temple, the family wanted to start a religious educational organization to carry on my father's work. He was considered a pioneer in the Americanization of Buddhism, a non-sectarian movement, very lay-oriented. Um, and uh, very liberal. And so the family did that. And so I've been doing that full time um, the last 10 years. And, and, the, and our organization is called the Also Bright Dawn Institute for American Buddhism. And we have, uh, within the last year, we started a, a lay minister program. And Richard and Asayo were the, are the first, our first lay ministers. And we have a uh, a new crop. We, we have a new crop of students every year, starting in the fall. And our first other group is is one year old now. Okay, um, they've been. You know, we do um, audio conferencing uh, courses. Um, you know, and uh, students. We have five of them right now: Brazil, Hawaii, a couple from Wisconsin, one from Illinois. Every Sunday night, we meet in an audio conference. And they have some assigned readings and papers, and we have a curriculum, two-year curriculum. Okay. Um, uh, but to kick off that program last year, we installed four lay ministers who had 20, 30, 40 years of following my father's approach, and um, we installed them as lay ministers. And so Richard is one, and Asayo Horita, who lives in Evanston, and she's a woman. So I don't know what your group was like, but I thought it's a resource because she's very active. They put on a, a woman's, what did they call it, you, that conference they had at Nepal. A woman's uh, Buddhist conference. Buddhist conference, right. you know. We, were, we were highlighted, uh, you know. Women's uh, activities and Buddhism. Speakers and everything, and they're going to do a second one next year. But I thought she might be a good resource if they were, you know, for, for in terms of women. So. Um, but she couldn't make it, but she's, she's interested. She has also had chaplaincy training, and uh, so I thought maybe between the three of us we could offer some resources um, in terms of your, your interest. So that's a, 